let's go ahead and turn in the Word of God to Psalm 96. Psalm 96, uh, as we continue our summer psalms. Uh, we've got a few more weeks of this before we uh, start our new year in here as well. Uh, psalm 96, and let's do this. Let's just uh, go ahead and read through it together. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll walk through it. Uh, psalm 96, beginning in verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established and shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples in his faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you tonight, we are thankful uh, for what we've just read in your word. You are the great God. You are true and right and faithful. And Lord, one day you're going to judge all things and set all things right. And we anticipate and look forward to that day. And Father, as we come, I, I ask that you would forgive us, Lord, for where our worship is less than what it should be. Where we fail to to bring glory and honor uh, to you uh, in our heart, in our mind, in our life. You alone are worthy of all honor and glory. And I'll be the first to acknowledge tonight that I am insufficient to speak of, of the glories of, of your word and of who you are. But I pray that you would move in spite of me, that uh, your Holy Spirit would, would move among us, that we might be... Uh, just rooted in the truth. I pray, Lord, that our view of you would just grow and increase. Our love for you might deepen. And Lord, as a result, that you would use us for your good purposes. I'm thankful for this time we can come together and just bear one another's burdens and, and, and bring our requests before you. I'm thankful that your word tells us that we can come before the throne of grace and find help in time of need. And Lord, that we can call on you and know that you hear us. Lord, we trust in that, and Lord, our faith is in, uh, in you tonight, uh, in your sovereign working. Lord, even through the trials and through the storms that, that we have lifted up to you to this evening, Lord, we know that you're working all things according to your purpose for your glory and for our good. And Oh, God, we ask that you would uh, accomplish your purpose here tonight. Work in spite of me, I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. But you'll remember last week when we, we finished up Psalm 95, we saw two things, really. We saw a, a, an invitation or a call to worship and then a word of warning. And Psalm 96 is going to sound similar to that. And at the same time, there's, a, there's, there's some big differences in the way in which it flows. And so we're going we're gonna to see those differences tonight. Uh, there's no title for the 96th Psalm. Again, we're not given insight necessarily to who wrote it or what it was surrounding. But we do know this. If we jump back, um, and you, I'm not going to have you turn, but First Chronicles chapter 16, when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem by David, David had a song written for that occasion. And a portion of that song is what we have here in Psalm 96. All right? And so most likely Psalm 96 was written by David uh, later translations, uh, they, they ascribe the, 
you know, the, the, the account of why Psalm 96 was written to the, to the temple being completed after exile. And so it's very likely that David penned this psalm when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into the temple in Jerusalem. And then they, they captured a portion of that and they used it in a new song to sing about the temple that had been rebuilt in Jerusalem following exile. And so it's a song that's meant to celebrate the presence of God. It's meant to celebrate the worship of God and his faithfulness and his deliverance. So that gives you a little bit of insight into where we're going. And when we start off, we see again this call to worship. In fact, as we finish out book four of the Psalms, most of them are going to be along those lines. We're going to see this again and again, uh, an invitation or a call to worship. And this one starts in verses one and two. You see this, this, this uh, repetition. Oh, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. Right. And so we have this invitation to sing, to lift up our voices. And and we talked a lot about singing last Wednesday. And so I don't want to spend too much time on that tonight about the importance of it and why we do it. But singing gives us an opportunity to take what's what's in our heart and what's in our mind and apply it to our affections and let that come out in our voices. Right. It's 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 meant to promote wholehearted worship. Right. And that's, that's why I love, uh, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. You know, that that song is not the picture of a thousand people gathered together, but it's one man saying, I wish I had a thousand tongues that I could use to praise and worship this God. You know, that's the imagery. That's the picture here. There's someone who just he wants with everything he is to sing praises to this God. And that's the heart behind this three times sing to the Lord, right? Again, the object of the worship is this Jehovah God. But notice he says, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, that, that's a, you know, it's not talking here about a song that's been newly penned. Uh, when we see a new song in the scriptures, it's always in reference to the redemption of God's people. Uh, you see this imagery in Psalm 40, right? The psalmist was saying, I was in the pit. You know, I, I had no help. I had no hope. But God pulled me out of the pit and set my feet on a rock. And it was just an image of the salvation that God has given to his people. And he says, he has placed in my heart a new song. Right? And, and so when you see this idea, sing to the Lord a new song, it's saying, the redeemed people of God, lift your voices to the Lord. Because of the salvation that you have experienced, you think of, think of uh, his, his, you know, his, his lamentations, his mercies are new every morning. And so this is a song that we can continually sing anew day in and day out because we've experienced the mercy and the grace of this God. Right? So he says, sing to the Lord a new song. And here's where we start to see a change from Psalm 95. Remember Psalm 95 let us worship. Let us shout, right? It was a call for corporate worship, for the people of God to sing and worship, to worship their God. Now, here's the shift. We see it in verse 2, right? Or, I'm sorry, verse 1. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Now, that's different, right? Because here, the invitation of the call to worship is not simply to the people of God. It's to everyone, right? And so the, the psalmist is shifting his focus here outward away from merely the corporate gathering to the entire earth he's saying you know, let the redeemed of the lord sing but no all the earth sing bless his name now again the idea here is when it says bless the name singing blessing the name of the lord is is singing for who he is his name represents his his character right there's when you when you hear a name it, it immediately brings to your mind certain characteristics, certain attributes, right? And so here, we're blessing the name of the Lord for, for who he is. Uh, you know, and and we'll, we'll see that as we kind of walk through this, some of the characteristics that, that flow out of Psalm 96. But you know, when I say the name of Jesus, right? You, we, we say so, you know, there's power in the name, right? There's, there's, no, there's you know, no, nothing like the name of Jesus. We sing that. You know, when I say the name of Jesus, certain things pop into your head immediately. Right? And so the same thing is true here when he says, bless the name of the Lord. All that he is, all of his characteristics, all of his attributes, 
sing to the Lord. And then, again, this worship, this call to worship, it's, 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 almost, it's almost a repeat. Right? And so we're going to look at them together. But down in verses 7 and 8, we see a very similar call, right? an invitation here. In verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. Right? So three times, once again, now we're moving away from singing to, to giving. That's what you ascribe, and, and, and your translation may actually say give, but it, it has the idea of giving, the due, giving someone what is due them. So ascribe is a good, it's a good word because it means that not only am I giving this, but it's rightfully his. Right? And so we ascribe to the Lord. We're giving to the Lord. And that three, that em, you know, it just emphasizes the importance of this. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Now you hear it again, right? He's asking not just the people of God here, but he's asking all peoples, all the families, to give the glory to God that is due him alone. In fact, that's what he says, right? Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord glory. Give to the Lord strength. I read that and I think, how do you do that? How do you, you, can, you can't make God more glorious than he already is. It, it's just a matter of what? <laughs> I, I can't add to him, so I'm going to give to him what is rightfully his. The glory due his name. We say this so often and remind you of this truth, but we were created for God's glory. You exist for this purpose, primarily for this purpose, that God be glorified in you, right? And so think through that, right? Your life is meant to bring the glory to God that is due his name. And that means that when we give glory to something other than God, we're robbing him of what is rightfully his. Are you with me? So you can never repay that debt. You can't go back and say, well, I'm going to make up for where I robbed him here because in this moment that you exist, you are meant to bring God glory. Right? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So anytime we're failing in that, we're robbing God of what is rightfully his. And so he pleads with the peoples, oh, give God the glory due his name. He implores them in verse 8. <laughs> he says, bring an offering and come into his courts. Right? Come and worship. You know, uh, I, th I think of Romans chapter 12. You know, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your your reasonable, your reasonable act of worship, right? That's the, that's the imagery here. Present your whole self to him as an offering. Come, come into his courts. Come into his presence. You know, it, it's the presence of God here, right? Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. It's the presence of God that ignites this kind of worship. Uh, I'm not going to take time to, to turn this evening, but in Psalm 137, in the first four verses, you, you have a picture here of, of this time of exile. When, when they were in Babylon, and they, they, they weren't in Jerusalem, there was no temple, and they didn't, and, and it, it says that the Babylonians wanted them to sing their songs. And they said, how can we sing? How can we sing when we're separated from the presence of our God? And so it, coming back into his presence, it just incites worship. And it's a good reminder for us, right? As we gather together in the presence, right? Two or three are gathered in my name. He is in the midst. When we come together in the presence of God, it's for the purpose of worship. And, and so as we come into his presence, it should move us. And there's a, there's a right way to come into his presence. He says, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him. Has it? The idea of coming before him with a right, right heart, a right spirit. You think of, think of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, holy, 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 the angels are saying, and Isaiah just crumbles in the presence of the Lord. Woe is me, I am undone. 
And God touches his lips with the coal and it makes him clean. But it's a reminder as we come for worship, we must come in holiness. Right? And so we, we often say that as we come together to worship. It, you know, Lord, may we worship you in the beauty and the splendor of holiness. And that's something that we, we must rely on Christ for, right? Because we fall short of that every single day. And as we gather together, we're bringing all that baggage in. And so as we come, let's come prepared, <laughs> trusting in, relying on the righteousness of Christ, having our sins confessed and forsaken and turned away from. And walking in the forgiveness that's found only in Christ. Right? This is the, the picture here. Is we, the, the invitation to worship. And then how we come for worship. And then he doesn't stop there. He also gives the cause of worship. And we see it in verses 4 through 6. Why? Why should we sing? Why should we give this glory to God? For great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. He is to be feared Above all gods. Why worship him? Because there's none like him. There's nobody like this God. Right? We, we talked about that last week. And so I don't want, again, don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But let your mind think on how great and how glorious he is. He is the omnipotent God. He is the omniscient God. He is the omnipresent God. He is sovereign over all creation. There's none like him. And, and when it says here he is to be feared above all gods, it doesn't mean that there's contenders, right? In fact, he goes on to say in verse 5, for all the gods of the people are worthless idols. There's no room for another god. There is no other god. All the other gods are nothing. They're worthless. You, you realize that the message of Christianity is very narrow, very straight. There's no room for this thinking that you know, we're, all, we're all heading towards the same path in the end. Right? We're just heading up different sides of the mountain, and when we get there, no. There's only one true God. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So we, we have a picture of a God who is very exclusive, The, the psalmist here is calling for the, the peoples of the earth to cast away their worthless idols and to worship the true God. The call to worship is saying, leave behind those nothing, that, that worthlessness, and come find true satisfaction and substance. Uh, my mind immediately just goes to the land of India, right? the land of <laughs> a billion different gods. On every street corner, worthless, worthless idols. And, and the only difference between them and us is that they put little statues up. And we don't, but we have, we have idols everywhere. And the reality is anything that we're pursuing, that we're looking for satisfaction and joy in apart from him is worthless. It's worthless. And so the call is turn away from that and worship him for who he is. Verse 6 says, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. This is the great God. All strength, all majesty, all beauty belong to him. So we worship him for who he is. And then we worship him for what he's done. Again, <laughs> you know, he says, But the Lord made the heavens. He is the creator of all things. The heavens declare the glory of God, according to Psalm 19.1. So we worship him for who he is. We worship him for what he has done. Verse 2 says, declare his salvation from day to day. This is the God who has redeemed, the God who has rescued, the God who has saved us. Why worship him? Yes, because of who he is, but because of what he's done for us. God's purpose in all the earth is to be worshipped. So let's make the connection here now with what the psalmist is doing. I told you it's a little different. 
right, from, from Psalm 95. We have the same invitation, the same call to worship, but this, this psalmist has experienced the greatness and the glory of God in such a way that his desire is to praise him with his entire being. But that's not enough. It's not enough for him to praise God with all that he is. It's not even enough for him for all of Israel to praise and worship God with all that they are. He stops and he says, what? No, all the earth in verse 1. Verse 3, all the peoples. Verse 7, families of the peoples. His desire is what? That they will experience, everyone in, on the whole earth will experience the greatness and the glory of this God. He wants everyone to know. He wants everyone to experience. Now, we can understand that, right? You, you get excited about things, and when you're excited about something, you tell people about it. We do this all the time, right? You, you find a new product or a new service that works, and what do you do? Hey, did you, have you heard about this? Have you seen this? This is amazing. This is awesome. This can help you. If you turn on, <laughs> my wife likes to watch the QVC Right? And, and I, I don't really care for that a whole lot. But when I'm walking by and I hear all this, this will change your life. Right? This, this toaster oven or this waffle iron or whatever, will, it'll change your life. Right? But we, we do that, right? We, we experience things and we say, this is great. Here's what the psalmist is saying. I found the greatest treasure, the greatest glory. There's no one like this God. Have you seen him? Do you know him? Have you experienced him? See, this is the, this is the natural outflow. This is, what do we call this? We call it missions, right? Missions is when we are so captivated with God that we go and we tell other people about him. See, missions is the natural outflow of a passion for God. You know, worship in and in of itself leads to mission. As you get a glimpse of the glory of God, you'll be like Isaiah who says, here my Lord, send me. You know what his mission was? You go and tell and they're not going to listen. But he was so captivated with the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God, he said, I'll go. I'll tell. I'll speak. And when we've truly experienced this God, we can't help but keep our you, you, you can't keep your mouth shut. You have to share. You have to tell. I think this is the greatest detriment to the church fulfilling the Great Commission is we have such a low view of God that we're not moved to tell people about Him. We're moved to tell people about the waffle iron or whatever it is, right? But not about this God who rescues and saves because we don't have a view of this great and glorious God. Because once we've grasped that, this, it's the natural outflow. It, and this is what's happening here, right? You see it. Psalm 96. Look at verse 2. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. What's he saying here? This is the call to witness, right? Worship leads to witness and it, it's a command here to tell to declare in verse 10 he says say among the nations this is the heart of the psalm i'm singing i'm worshiping i'm glorying this god come worship sing with me tell of his salvation from day to day how people need to hear we are surrounded by people who need this truth. They need to know. They need to know the reality of the gospel. They need to hear this new song for themselves. Day to day, wherever you go, whoever you meet, tell of his salvation. Declare his glory. Tell people this is the one truth. You know, this, is, this is not politically correct how they need to hear it. There's only one true God, and he deserves our worship. He says, tell his marvelous works among the nations, among all peoples. You hear the, you hear the global heart 
of this man. He's not focused on him. He's not focused on one local area. He's saying, everybody needs to hear this. He realized that there are over 16,000 people groups. That's what this word is talking about. Nations, peoples, 16,000 people groups in the world. That's 7.3 billion people divided up into 16,000 people groups. Of that 16,000 people groups, 6,700 are what we would call unreached people groups. Now, they fall into a special class. Unreached people groups mean that there's less than 2% of that people group who have heard the gospel. The the likelihood is, if you are one of those 6,700 people, within that 6,700 people groups, you will live and you will die and you will never hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's 40% of the world's population that will live and die and never hear the gospel. That's really what's happening? And it, it is. Then we need, to, we need to stop with the games, right? In his book, The Trellis and the Vine, the author writes that this is really what God is doing in the world. It's time to say goodbye to our small and self-oriented ambitions and to abandon ourselves to the cause of Christ and his gospel. Declare, tell, day to day. And it's a heart that moves to the nations itself. We always say we're a mission-minded church. I pray that's true, that we're, we're willing to go across the street and around the world and make sure this message is being declared to the corners of the earth people need to hear this is the end result right this is the goal (laughs) declare his glory among the nations right this is what Habakkuk says in chapter 2 the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord in the end everyone will see him for who he is every knee shall bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord but the the cause the cause for worship and witness is in our last few verses here, in, in verses 10 to 13. It says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. There is a God, one God, and He is reigning over all creation. And we're going to stand before Him as judge. Right? And, and then the psalmist is now looking far out, far ahead. He says in verse 11, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. Why? For he comes. Right? The psalmist is thinking forward to the end, the culmination of all things, when God's glory fills the earth. And he's saying, in light of this truth, this is why we worship. This is why we witness. Because this God who comes is going to judge the world in righteousness in the peoples in his faithfulness. And there's a celebration in that as the people of God rejoice in the righteousness that we have in Christ. And yet there's a warning for anyone who would turn away from this glorious God and reject his gospel. That they will be judged in righteousness, in fairness. <laughs> we say that all the time, right? You don't want what's fair. Because in all fairness, we deserve the wrath of God in hell for eternity. But by his grace and mercy, we can experience this new life, new birth, new song in Christ. In fact, that's the way we'll, we'll finish up. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Right? This is the culmination. Revelation chapter 5 and verse, verse 9. Here we see the people of God gathered around his throne and they sang a new song saying 
Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You see the culmination from every tongue, every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation worshiping the Lord. This is where everything is headed. So we should join in, right? Now, let us worship, let us ascribe to him the glory due his name. The desire of those who know this God is that others would experience him. This really, this really must be the driving force of our life, of our church, If we're going to fulfill the mission that God has given us, then Psalm 96 is is our great commission. (laughs) Tell of his salvation from day to day. Ascribe him the glory due his name. Ask yourself, what does that look like for me? What does that look like for us as a church? And then maybe maybe you say, "I, I just don't have, I don't have that passion. I don't have that desire that you're talking about. What do I do? Ask for it. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to see his beauty and his glory and his majesty. Spend some time in the word and in prayer and allow him to move you that you might see. And as you see, then you will say (laughs) and he will send and you'll proclaim the good news. We're out of time tonight, so... Let me encourage you to to think much on this glorious God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.